Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Around the Coin. Today's guest is Oleg Fomenko. Oleg is the co-founder of Sweatcoin. Oleg is a serial entrepreneur who has launched a number of successful businesses, including a music subscription service that grew to 1.3 million users. Oleg played a key role in defining Sweatcoin as a health currency driven by his extensive experience and knowledge of behavioral change. Oleg believes that technology can positively impact a user's health habits by leveraging human biology and sustainably altering behavior. Sweat Economy and the Sweat Token has come out of the momentum of Sweatcoin with over 110 million registered users. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. Here is Oleg Fomenko. All right, Oleg, I'm excited to chat with you. You're running a project called Sweatcoin, uh, which is running off the momentum of Sweat, the company, sweat.com, uh, which is a massively successful project. Um, tell me about this transition from the business to Sweatcoin and how, you, how the whole thing kind of went down. Great to be here, Mike. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. A um, couple of really small corrections. Actually, the original Web2 business was called Sweatcoin. And the reason why we call it Sweatcoin is because already in 2015, we wanted to be on blockchain and we were hoping to be crypto, uh, you know, since then. What happened subsequently is we realized that there was only one blockchain uh, back then, Bitcoin, and it was very difficult to build on it and it had very low throughput, which hasn't changed until now of like eight transactions per second maximum. So we've decided that we're going to do our minimum viable product centralized without the blockchain and we'll move to blockchain um, as soon as we can. Fast forward to 2016, we're launching and our proposition, which is um, to make the world more physically active. We basically pay you to walk and we pay you in sweat points, as the name suggests. Um, as I mentioned, we launched centralized. The proposition was really loved by the market and users. And by early 2017, we were already processing several hundred transactions per second at peak. So our decision of not building on blockchain was really kind of a very important decision that saved our lives. Ever since then, every year we were looking into blockchain space and were hoping to find new, faster, better technologies to move on to. But it wasn't possible until last year when all of a sudden, like buses in London, they started coming in threes. So all of a sudden there was Solana, there was Near, there was Avalanche, there was Polygon, there were, you know, kind of lots of layer twos uh, that were very exciting. So after doing our scouting and analysis, we realized that the time is right and now we can start building. So we've done a lot of user research, conversations with our users, also quant, uh, so quantitative studies to understand that, you know, it's not that just anecdotally our users want us to become crypto, but it's overwhelming desire of our um, user base. And we selected a partner. I'm sure that we're going to get to it a little bit later. We've chosen Near to build on and we've started building. So we now have two businesses effectively, a web two business called Sweatcoin with more than 100 million users, 35 million actives, and it's profitable. And we're constructing second part uh, of the business, which is web three, and it's called Sweat Economy. And it is going to bring into the world our new token called Sweat that will coexist alongside Sweatcoin that will remain the center of our Web2 health and fitness app, Sweatcoin. Sweat will be decentralized, it will be uh, deflationary, and it will be completely open. So you will be able to use it anywhere where you'll be able to uh, use crypto. Okay, great, great description. And you, you've raised roughly 13 million for is it sweat coin yeah. or is that for the this is a token sale so mm -hmm. this is uh, uh the money that we raised uh just 
pre-selling um, our tokens. Before then, we raised more than six million um, into our Web2 centralized business. So all in, we raised about 20 million. And millions of users. It, I imagine, is the, pro is the company profitable today and using much of the proceeds to build on Web3 or near? Yes, absolutely. Um, we're one of the very unusual and very rare health and fitness apps in Web2 that managed not only to acquire a lot of users, but also to you know, build a sustainable business. We've been profitable for more than two years. And how did you guys do it? Like, what, what did you realize before other people realized it? Or what, what strategy worked best to mm. get you guys there? Yeah, you know, very, very good question. I think that we've, uh, we've had a thinking of a Web3 company from very early days. And we're very excited to move into Web3, but I'm sure that we'll come to it a little bit later. Why? Um, but we started thinking immediately, um, sort of holistically, and not uh, only as uh, sort of most health and fitness apps would do, where they would have a freemium model and, you know, they would have products for free. And then it would be selling premium subscriptions and, you know, hopefully the premium subscriptions would, uh, would cover costs. We've started in a completely different place and we've started with our users wanting to be more physically active and wanting to you know, gain something in exchange for being more physically active than they were before. And having Sweatcoin allowed us to basically create a marketplace where brands, services, you know, kind of anything to do with health, fitness, fashion, vanity, um, you know, kind of make up accessories, dog accessories, because a lot of our users own dogs and, you know, they walk quite a lot. Um, uh, all these brands were very, very interested to get in front of our users and all of a sudden advertising as well as sort of user acquisition or bringing in users to brands that are interested in physically active audience or in people who want to be more physically active, you know, we could give them really, really compelling positions. So we ended up having three revenue streams, advertising, partnerships, and premium subscriptions, which allowed us to uh, generate very healthy profits. And do you feel that Sweat somehow cracked the code on getting direct advertisers better and that was the key because i would imagine that that comes subsequent you know it comes after you have you know a ton of users like it's not i would imagine other health apps are probably like well you know if i had 20 million active users yeah i could go reach out to you know lululemon and they'd be interested but is it do you feel like it's some is it a soft combination of good user experience for onboarding uh like some community aspect of it maybe celebrity influencer or, or like is there a strategy that kind of hit home that got you to the point when you then had leverage to go and get the advertisers very good question very perceptive um yes of course uh, you know it wasn't smooth sailing and we needed to do a lot of other stuff but um i think the key were proposition that is very simple, very straightforward, and is very interesting and compelling for people to even talk about to other people. You know, we make you more physically active. We pay you to walk. People loved talking um, about us with, you know, kind of with their friends and relatives. Have you heard of this app? It pays you to walk. What do you mean? You know, how is that possible? Somebody can pay you to walk. Or just go and figure it, you know, kind of try it for yourself. People come in, you know, kind of a lot of people would come in and it's like, well, that's impossible. You know, and you must be selling data or something. So they would come in with a bit of a kind of feisty you know, but then they realized that actually this works and works year after year and the products are improving and there is more and more offering. So at the very beginning, of course, it was hard, but even when we had like 10,000 users, we were able to have a compelling proposition to brands for whom 10,000 users was like, oh my God, this is fantastic. So we're working with micro brands, with really, really small businesses. And as we were growing, the businesses that we're partnering with have been also growing. And, you know, kind of proposition, 
great deal of growth in our partnerships. But there is another thing, of course, we're totally obsessed with products and with user experience and making sure that it is really, really kind of good looking, magical and functions extremely well. And there is an aspect in the product that also helped us to separate ourselves from a lot of copycats that emerged in sort of 2016, 2017, which is we've been totally obsessed with accuracy of data mm. and with the need to verify movement. Because as soon as you start rewarding people for physical activity, one of the first things that people do, not even the, you know, kind of to, 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 to kind of gain you, but to just check, you know, people will check the phone and will try to get some steps and convert them into sweat coins. And this is one of the first things that we needed to solve, like all the shaking, all these bumps, all these cradles that shake your phone, you know, putting the phone on your dog and letting the dog run in the park, putting your phone on top of a dishwasher or, you know, and you name it, you know, they've tried it. There is a website that's called unfitbits.com that has like dozens of ways of tricking your wearable or your phone into believing that you're physically active when you're not. So all of those things we had to solve for, collect data and make sure that nobody can trick us into believing that they're active when they're not. And this has been a bit of an obsession and a lot of businesses that tried to copy us, they really didn't pay attention to this. So they simply accepted the face value and whatever phone reported. And as soon as you kind of earn some tokens or coins by shaking your phone, it immediately destroys your trust that these things are valuable because if I can shake and earn, everyone else can. So this is worthless. This is not worth engaging with. Our experience was completely different. People were like, ah, you sold this one. Okay, so that means I genuinely have to sweat for this. Yes. Okay, all of a sudden, they started believing that these sweat coins have value, that it is worth collecting them and worth spending them. So, you know, kind of, this is something that's been there from the very, very beginning because our vision is not to create a just sort of sticky app. Our vision is to create a currency that is the expression of physical activity value. What would be totally amazing is to turn this physical activity that everyone knows and understands have value because, you know, and I'm saying physical activity has value, you will not in. Everyone is not in because we do know that if we're more physically active, we're going to live longer, we're in a better mood, we're fitter, you know, kind of your doctor uh, will be very happy, your family is extremely happy if you're physically fit, your insurer, your employer, your country. So, you know, kind of, we know it's valuable. The funny thing is that everyone knows it's valuable, but nobody knows how valuable it is. It's really quite bizarre that we have a universal agreement that there is value, but it does not have a numerical expression. You cannot collect it, you cannot exchange it, you cannot power those interactions that should exist there. You should be able to get a discount on your health and life insurance if you're more physically active. You should be able to demonstrate to your doctor or to your trainer that you know, you're being physically active. Your employer is already motivating people to be more physically active. So all of these interactions can start existing and you know, can really make sense if we're creating this unit of physical activity. And this is where sweat comes in, because we now are finally at scale moving into the world and Web3 allows us to build this unit of currency that is backed, that is generated by you being physically active and that is filled with that value. So. A few years down the line, I am dreaming of the, you know, press sort of coverage that says physical activity has gone 20% up last week. That would be amazing because people will start thinking more and more about physical activity as something of value. That will help them to put one foot in front of another more times per day. That will create such an immense wealth for humanity through those things that I've already described. You know, can, through health, through increasing life expectancy, through improving mood and productivity, etc., etc., reducing healthcare costs, 
There's just countless examples of positive impact. And if we do that, and if we capture even just percentages of that value, God, you know, just sedentary behavior alone costs the world two trillion dollars a year. Two trillion. This is, you know, kind of, it's an amazing opportunity. It's huge for the world and for, you know, kind of each individual person. And of course, for us as a business. Interesting. Uh, so yeah, you mentioned a few things. So I think of the hardware component, like if I picture Fitbit or Apple Watch or the phone as being different pipes of data. So I would imagine that if you're going mm -hmm. through a third party like uh, Apple Watch or Fitbit or something, these guys have their own algorithms to do this process of uh, fraud detection effectively, for lack of a better word, right? So it, it, is that the case where you're, you're just, is, you, do you take in the raw data from Fitbit and Apple Watch and then process it? Or do they pipe it to you and say, this is how many steps kind of in a interpreted algorithmic format? Because I'd imagine if you're taking it raw from the phone, then you have to do the work technically of determining what's legitimate versus what's not. But is it, is it like what percentage of the market is phone versus some sort of device? Very good question. I don't think that I'm going to be able to answer what percentage of all the data that we have is coming from wearables, but I would imagine that it's going to be in sort of low double digit percentages. Mm -hmm. So phones are a lot more ubiquitous. And to be honest, are also a lot more precise because uh, phones pack a lot more um, sensors that allow to triangulate and verify um, accuracy of that uh, uh, information. So we're definitely not accepting data supplied by devices uh, uh, at face value. We are collecting a lot more detailed, raw info that allows us to, you know, basically make a decision out. Ah, this is not walking. This is shaking. Uh, this is not walking. This is, you know, cradle. Because yes. you'd see there are a lot of uh, Web3 move to earn projects that, you know, if they haven't done a really thorough job at, uh, you know, kind of verifying and validating movement, it's yeah. way too easy by using those sort of phone farms in sort of far east to basically feast them and you know extract a lot of value by doing very very little, which destroys trust and mm -hmm. destroys the you know destroys them as a business. Right, right. Okay, and I imagine you have some intelligent way of capping it. So if somebody was like, okay, this guy's running a marathon every day, maybe that's legitimate, maybe it's not, but is there is there like a converging cap on, I mean, you can't be making a million dollars on this app by, yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, we do have, uh, uh, and, and it's not uh, even as elaborate as that. We actually have a simple straightforward cap of 10,000 steps mm -hmm. that you would be able to convert per day. This is a world, you know, kind of renowned and accepted uh, sort of daily uh, walking norm that World Health Organization is uh, recommending. So we are sticking to it right now. If you want, you can convert more and we have in the premium level, you can actually convert up to 50,000 steps. But, you know, kind of there uh, we, you know, kind of we're using all of that know-how and that we call it verification model that that has sort of four different levels of uh, protection to make sure that nothing, unless it's genuine movement, can uh, can go through. But, you know, for majority of users, the cap is 10,000. And even if someone for a very short period of time until our model really sort of figures out what, what's going on here, even if they figure out how to, you know, kind of trick our model as believing that this is genuine movement, they're not going to be able to scale this uh, uh, horizontally because yeah. as soon as multiple accounts, you know, appearing, this is immediately really, really visible, and you know, we pick it up in, you know, kind of in a snap. And how much would someone make if they walk ten thousand steps in a day? 
So, you know, we, with Sweatcoin, the token economics, and this is the centralized currency and it's inflationary. Uh, one Sweatcoin is 1,000 steps and it doesn't really have an established exchange rate because, you know, kind of it's centralized, it's inflationary and it has utility only inside uh, our app. But despite this, there are, you know, kind of informal exchanges and some people are trading in and out. We strongly discourage that because this is just so ripe for scamming. You know, people report that, oh, you know, somebody told me that, you know, kind of they'll pay me money and they didn't. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. you know, please, 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 if you're listening, don't fall for this. But it's very curious that people are already trading in a currency that is not even crypto, it's not a token and it's not on blockchain. That gotcha. is one of the biggest reasons why we want to create SWAT to make sure that we protect um, kind of users who want to trade in their physical activity because with SWAT being on near and being on blockchain, it's going to be a lot harder to, uh, to scam people. Got it. So previously it was closed garden. You couldn't do anything. It's kind of like loyalty points for an app that you probably can upgrade, see different instructors, videos, or have badges yeah. on your profile, th that sort of thing. And then now with the coin web three, you can say, this is actually, you can actually look at this as a revenue generator. Is that the intention or maybe subsequent unintended outcome of this? And I, it does that. And does that, does that make sense? Like, uh, if I think of somebody's incentive to be healthy, you know, I would imagine there's got to be a direct correlation between if you're, if you're going to give me one biometric, like one piece of data about someone correlates to negative health, it's probably going to be weight. You know, if you're overweight, like the United States, especially in some parts of the country, it's like 30%, 35% obesity rates. And, and there's other countries close, like Mexico is close. Um, and it has yeah. to do, I'm sure, with the sedentary lifestyle. People are on their phones and the computers, like 75% of the day, they're waking hours. And then also the food yeah. is like, you know, highly caloric and high in sugar and everything else. So there's like this perfect storm where people are quite unhealthy. And then you also add to that, the health insurance model is set up to like your employer pays for it. So you don't actually experience the direct cost. So it's like this confusing cloud of exactly. costs. And, and I would imagine people, this is something I don't understand. And I'm curious if you have an insight into this. There, there, there has to be a human drive to be maybe not optimal health, but like physically capable of moving your body without pain and doing basic kind of activities you want to do. There's a certain intrinsic reward for that, that, uh, th that feels to me intuitive, but I, I wonder what, what it is, what is it that some people feel they need more than that? They need to be paid to move. Um, like talk to me a little bit about this, uh, what your view is on the psychology or the demographic of per people that are most motivated not by the in intrinsic reward of being healthy, but by like, we have to make money and, and secondary is, oh, by the way, I lose weight. Is like, who, who are the, these kind of people? Why are like, what are you seeing in the market? Very so perceptive and very interesting commentary that goes quite deep into mm. uh, kind of psychology. And, um, that sends me back all the way to creation uh, of the business, because you touched on uh, um, a topic or a subject that basically brought our idea or kind of uh, our hypothesis into a product. And um, what we found really interesting when we start talking to people about motivation to move, why aren't we able to be as active as we want, we've discovered that absolutely everyone, 100% of people, no matter if they are like ultra marathon runner and, you know, runs every day down to somebody who is barely moving and is overweight, they shared this feeling that they should be moving more and they would love to be more active, but something was stopping them. And when you stumble into a universal sort of behavior, then it typically means that you want something. There is, there is a very interesting and sometimes unexpected explanation as to why 
100% of humanity is experiencing this. And being sort of trained psychologist and spending time um, studying not just psychology, but also behavioral economics, we uh, quickly realized that the reason why we're not as active as we want to be is because nature doesn't want you to be active. Nature did not build you to be active. Nature built you to survive. And that means that you are sitting, preserving those precious calories that you managed to acquire, as opposed to being sort of active and burned, because being fit but calorie less is a lot more dangerous and is likely to lead your tribe to death than you sort of being sedentary mm -hmm. and waiting for the next mammals to show, <laughs> up, uh, to show up. And nature had to really, really drive that home. So nature created this behavioral feature back then, but right now it's working more like behavioral pun called present bias. So we only focus on right here, right now, avoiding pain, avoiding punishment, or sort of getting food and reward. So before, you know, kind of we would run when there was mammoths on the horizon and we need to eat, or when there was a saber to tiger uh, about to eat us. Otherwise, we would sit around the fire and preserve those calories. If you are just following nature's guidance, that's exactly what we continue doing right now. The trouble is, back then, food was scarce, calories were really rare. Mm. Right now, they come, mammoth shows up three times a day on the plate. So, if you sit between those meals, you, you know, you balloon. So, what was a survival feature right now is, you know, kind of terrible bug. And technology that we build with Sweatcoin is helping you to actually overcome it because it gives you instant gratification in exchange for every step that you take. What happens is that you start looking at it not as an expenditure of calories, but as an enrichment mechanism. Therefore, you're putting one foot in front of another more times, you're burning more calories, and so on and so forth. So it's a very, very basic kind of uh, psychological, I don't even say chemical explanation because you're changing, we are helping you to change your relationship with the movement from a wasteful in nature's perception to gainful from nature's perception. And it means that nature helps you to find that motivation, to find that energy, to find that sort of subtle drive to put more physical activity into your daily lives. And we know that it works because we've done very, very large scale research with the University of Warwick, that is one of the most respected universities in uh, sort of digital medicine in the UK, that has proven that our users are 20% more active after installing our app than they were before. So this intervention, this, you know, kind of this help, this motivation is definitely working. And right now with more than 100 million users, we know that it's working at scale that nobody expected. You know, we definitely can push it, you know, a lot further than this. Fascinating, fascinating. And how did you structure the ICO? So you said initially that you had this idea for Web3, the technology came about, you looked at different projects, it's like, let's build on near layer two. Uh, did you know this was gonna be, did you private list it? Like, uh, did you try to go to investors or did you bring on institutional investors first or was it like hey we mm -hmm. want to go uh, open market ico route like wh what were some of the most important decisions that you had to make when uh when when creating the token and and how did you think through those wow Partic there's a lot to unpack there well there, maybe, maybe uh, let Very... me give you let me give you a little bit uh, let me get a little bit more guidance here so i uh, one sure. thing i want to ask you about is the 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 structure of the organization so you say okay I, I'm not sure if you guys yeah. have a nonprofit. Typically, it'll have like a nonprofit yeah. that manages we have the foundation. Out. Yeah. Right. So, foundation, yeah. the foundation, typically, the decision points I've observed is uh, does the foundation, does the private entity dissolve over time? A lot of projects start with the LLC, dissolve that, go decentralized is the ultimate goal. Uh, so maybe, maybe it's different in your case. Maybe you need, like, need the dev shop to build no. the app or something. Okay. Um, that, that now was, this is you know kind of let me uh yeah i can i can definitely address this i think one of the toughest things for us given that we started in 2015 was to wait 
Um, <laughs> you know, can <laughs> always is. So uh, you you know that it is your vision. Uh, you know that you just want it, and uh, you know as soon as these two you know sort of things came together that technology enabled and users you know still wanted it and we understood that we can actually deliver on it that was the you know kind of the very exciting moment how did we actually approach it let me start with selection of the partner because uh, there is a very interesting story there in itself so we know that our scale is something that demands sort of unparalleled throughput speed um, of transactions per second and also given the fact that we are sort of creating value of movement we're not talking about whales we're not talking about people that you know have one billion in wealth so we're talking about huge number of users with fairly low mm. balances that are very very active and you know get involved so we needed a chain that was fast that was cheap and was also ecologically friendly because last thing you'd want to do is to persuade the world and people be more physically active and then burn heck of a lot of fossil fuels that you know been you manage to help them save by sort of helping them to jump out the buses and out of the cars and you know off their bikes so we wanted to continue sort of this ecological direction and when we were looking at the chains of course technology was one of the items but actually it was item number three the first one was vision the second one was the team, the third one was technology. And what we were looking for are the teams that had really um, different take on what they were building. And thankfully, we've encountered a number of them. And the typical approach that sort of uh, protocols or layer ones use or the um, measure of success is TBL, total value locked. Just the use of that word locked is just fundamentally wrong. Things need to work rather than being locked, being stashed away. This is not a you know, kind of sign of success. This is a sign of control uh, more than anything. And we felt that this is actually more gearing towards few people controlling huge amounts of money. So this is a whale friendly or this is a kind of whale focused strategy. Now near on the other hand are talking about sort of making Web3 mass market and bringing 1 billion people into Web3. Our vision is to make 1 billion people more physically active. You know, there could be, you know, it's very hard to imagine that there could be more strategic line in between sort of us and another Web3 protocol. So we're really, really excited about that. Um, the team, um, Ilya, Alex, the founders of uh, Near, and the team that they assembled and uh, you know pulled together is absolutely incredible to work with. It's uh, um, fantastic, and I sort of know that some people are not going to like what I'm going to say, but I far <laughs> prefer people who are not using word bro and are. Sort of throwing around, you know, kind of these sort of stories of kind of wasteful time spent and, you know, kind of what tokens that, you know, kind of they've done, but actually investing their time into building something that will change the world. And these guys are of that type and it's absolutely fantastic to work with them. You know, it's an absolute pure pleasure. And as I mentioned, then there is a technology, ecologically friendly, fast and cheap. So that's why we've chosen Nier as a partner. And the last bit is how are we approaching our, um, I guess it's not ICO, but, um, we're using the term, uh, you know, kind of IOs, initial change offering when you're getting uh, listed. So um, kind of our approach to it was the following. As I mentioned to you, we're building a currency that will become the unit of physical activity value and that means that it needs to be born out of your physical activity but in order to make sure that we are not repeating the sort of mistake i guess of sweat coin design we needed to make sure that it's not inflationary continuously and in order to deliver this 
we've uh, uh, we, we we use an approach that Bitcoin uses, where there is a continuous increase in minting difficulty. So, you know, we'll start again at one thousand steps to one sweat, but very very quickly, the difficulty to mint one sweat is going to go up, and by the end of the first year, you'll need to walk two to three thousand steps and so on and so forth. So the, that would mean that, I don't know, like in five years time, you're gonna to need to walk 10 to 15,000 steps, which basically in economic theory means increase, uh, increasing marginal cost of production. And that means that there is more physical activity packed in this unit of currency. And because of this, over time, this unit is becoming more and more representative of the value of physical activity, no, no matter how small it is. Even if value of one step is, I don't know, 15 zeros one, what will happen over time is that the value of sweat as a token is going to consist of more and more of these steps, and therefore it is going to become that sort of expression of physical activity, and it is going to be perceived as a unit of physical activity value the way the world sees it. So this is on the supply side. There are a couple of other things, you know, like inactivity fee, which is really exciting for us because, you know, we do understand psychology very well. You probably know or heard of loss aversion, you know, when people behave almost irrationally in order to avoid mm -hmm. loss, even though it's tiny. So in our world, because we're trying to make the world more physically active, uh, there will be small burns of sweat if you stop being physically active. So that will help us together with, with this tightening of uh, sort of conversion rate of steps to sweat, create a inflation that is approaching zero. And with uh, inactivity fee, we will even make it deflationary. Now, on the demand side, and this is where it gets really, really exciting because, you know, in Web2, we've already sussed out, as I mentioned to you, three revenue streams, advertising partnerships and uh, sort of user premium subscription. All of these revenue streams are perfectly replicable in Web3. And in fact, per user, they generate even higher revenues in Web3 than in Web2. But in addition, Web3 and the business model around it allows us to, you know, uh, to, to generate even more revenue. Just to name, to name just a few that you know, are already in development and will be rolled out quite soon after TGE. Um, NFTs that are linked to your level of physical activity, but also represent your sort of personality in the system that will be game mechanic uh, around that, that will allow you to evolve and change your NFT because it's going to be dynamic. Um, so that, you know, can it, it, it will be your representation in the, kind of in the world of uh, sweat coin. And we know that, you know, people engage with it, if not 100% of people, but for a considerable number, this is a very, very interesting engagement mechanism, and we're designing it again to make people more physically active. Then there are trading fees. We do know that our users want to trade sweat for other crypto tokens. And through partnership, we can offer a really, really slick and interesting experience to our users that will generate trading fees for the business. So on and so forth. There are kind of multitudes uh, of different revenue streams that we'll be testing. And now we're getting to two that I'm most excited about, but they'll take a little bit longer to build. Um, one is called alternative movement validators. So right now we only do convert your walking or running because, you know, kind of this is the type of physical activity that we focus on steps and detection of steps and verification of steps. There are businesses that are focusing on swimming, focusing on cycling, focusing on high intensity training, Zumba, etc. A lot of these businesses are working with us already and interested in a partnership that would enable them to track this physical activity, validate it and issue sweat 
to the users of their applications, allowing them to participate in the whole uh, kind of ecosystem. That will require, of course, taking some sweats to make sure that there is no kind of nefarious uh, uh, behavior and there is you know, kind of no incentive to uh, push erroneous data through, uh, through the system. So these partnerships are really, really exciting for us and create an additional demand for sweat in probably time span about one and a half to three years. I think we're going to start seeing some, uh, some, uh, some of these emerging. But the most exciting to me personally is we as a centralized business right now sitting on terabytes of really interesting and valuable physical activity data. The only thing that we do with it right now is we use it to validate if your physical activity is genuine or not. We are European, we are governed by GDPR, we do not monetize, we do not pass this information to nobody under no circumstances. We do believe it's yours. Now, when we are shifting our gears towards decentralization and, you know, kind of going into DAO, that answers sort of your question, that is vector of our movement. From foundation, we would like to move to DAO, and DAO takes over everything associated with uh, sweat, sweat economy, and, um, uh, and the app, Sweat Wallet, that is going to be sort of the center of uh, uh, using this, uh, uh, this token. When that becomes DAO, we will be able to pass this movement data into DAO so that you will be able to flip the switch and enable access to your data. And therefore, you will be able, through the use of DAO as a platform, to monetize your data and DAO will just collect a small um, kind of small fee for that. We know that this data is extremely valuable because there are very little sources of this information. To give you an example, when uh, COVID hit and Spain declared uh, that they were going for lockdown, Spanish lockdown was by far the worst in the whole of Europe. And we saw that within 48 hours, country lost 85% all physical activity. If you start seeing this so precisely, you can estimate the extra weight gained by your population. You can estimate extra healthcare costs that you're going to have to pump into the system in order to help these people. You can estimate the you know kind of life expectancy impact, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this information simply does not exist right now for insurers, for healthcare providers, for governments and statisticians. So we know that there is a huge market, huge need for this information because we get constantly bugged and asked if we would share this data and the answer is always no. But in the future, you would be able to make this decision. Millions of people by making this collective decision will create a market and will be able to earn from it. All right. Well, there's a lot there. Uh, you threw out the deflationary aspects of the, of the token, uh, which I, which is a, a curious design. I, I think it, what you described makes sense. It, you described the transaction fees and the NFT process, uh, and then you yeah. talked about data. So um, I think all that's exciting. I think moving to the DAO is exciting. I One thing I would just ask you quickly on this is if you create a, uh, a uh, a deflationary coin, I would imagine that people are very incentivized in the beginning days to move because the ROI is higher. Uh, but, but after, you know, 5,000 people or a million people or five years down the road, it's like, it's kind of like mining, right? If you had a early days, 2010, a Bitcoin miner in your living room is actually a positive ROI to, to have. Uh, but now it just doesn't make any sense. It's all consolidated. It's in like massive server farms and that's the only place you can make any money. Is there a is there is there like a trade off in design here when you think about the the sweat token where you say okay in the beginning we want people to use the app we want people to use the ecosystem generate tokens so like oh I walk five miles and I generate thirty dollars worth of sweat tokens I can then trade and make money but that gets harder and harder and harder till so like when my kids join in fifteen years it's like if they walk if they do a marathon they make fifty cents and it's like well why why bother is there is there that trade-off that, that you acknowledge in the design uh, in deflationary, like early incentives very, are there? You get a lot of early adopters, but then like down the road, you know, it's hard to get people on because the incentives are lower. It's, uh, um, 
it's a very interesting philosophical conversation because the reality is that the relationship is exactly opposite. So let me give you an example of Bitcoin. Um, following your logic, uh, mining would become less and less profitable and everyone would abandon it because with halving, you'd be receiving half the value. Right. And it's so, true, it's true, right. There's like far less miners, but they're far more lucrative for the miners that are mining. It's just harder to get in the game because you need supercomputers and millions of dollars. Exactly. Yeah. But the, the thing that happened by introducing this halving or constantly increasing the marginal cost of production, what happened was that the value of Bitcoin has gone up. And in order to maintain consistent reward for miners, all it would have to do is to double every four years, but it far exceeded that. So the point here is exactly the same. The hmm. principal thing and the, pre, you know, the first thing that it starts with is not the sweat, but the movement, your steps that you take will not miraculously become cheaper or faster. You're going to continue consuming that same amount of calories and you're not going to be able to all of a sudden walk five times faster in sort of uh, in, in two years time. You will be putting more value into one unit of sweat. And economic theory says that the value of one sweat is going to increase in line with that, which means that if you're going to be earning whatever, I don't know, $1 or you know, $10 now, even if it is going to be 0 0.001 sweat 100 years down the line, provided the value of one sweat has grown up in line with movement or more, that 0 0.01 can actually be a lot more lucrative and a lot more valuable to you than right now. Mm, gotcha. So gotcha. what we're doing is that we are creating this unit of physical activity value. We're not creating a sort of thing filled with some ethereal stuff, whatever. We, you know, we want uh, this this token to be a representation of how much the world is putting value into physical activity. And of course, as any startup you bootstrap it at the beginning. So you put everything that we have, you know, we put all the attention stuff, yeah. advertising, this and this and this and this and this. But with time, the physical activity, you know, the validators, the data starts to take over and become the main driver of value of this token. And ultimately, you know, when you're going to see sweat somewhere reported, you're going to look like, you know, you're going to look at it and kind of go, oh, okay, that's, you know, kind of that, that, that's how the world perceives right now the value of my, I don't know, 5,000 steps uh -huh. uh, for today. Mm -hmm. And we want that to happen because then people are going to kind of look at it and kind of go, shit, you know what, I need to put, you know, more, more, more steps into my day. Yeah. They will create value for themselves. They will create value for humanity. They will kind of make all of us you know, kind of in, in a better place. Yeah, yeah. Um, we comment on that and then I'll ask you the last question. So I think the key, if I'm in your shoes, I'm thinking you're effectively saying, um, and tell me if this is, this is putting words in your mouth, but the deflationary design of the token makes sense. You were incentivizing people in the short term, you know, like come now, the, the ROI is great. But down the line, the, yeah. the tokens, the USD, right, the conversion rate is going to be is going to be higher. So if you hold your tokens, they'll be worth more in the future. And so I would think, if I'm in your shoes, the percentage of people or the percentage of the tokens issued that are exchanged for like Bitcoin or some stablecoin within the first 24 hours of them being minted, issued to the to the users, that's that's a that's probably a key indicator of the uh, the the, the perceived future value increase of the token. Because people hold Bitcoin because they believe tomorrow it's going to be worth more today. And there's like whole macroeconomic theses on like the decline of the American empire and the depegging of the US dollar and like the world, like there's a whole yeah. thing that fits into the story of Bitcoin. And I think the, the people have to say, okay, sweat is going to be another reserve, a reserve store of value. 
that that is going to be worth more in the future than it is to today. And I think I don't know I don't know the answer, but I <laughs> but I know that that's that's kind of like the that's what people will be running in their head. They're like, okay, I just made twenty sweat. Okay, do I just trade it in for Bitcoin now or USD, or do I hold it for the future? And if they if they dump it constantly, then it'll be a fight to uh, raise the value of the sweat versus USD. But you know that's that's the challenge, right? Nobody. This is all in the fu- we're on the Western yeah. frontier here, so you know, figure it out as we go. No, absolutely. Uh, I, you know, kind of, I, I totally agree. If that happens, however, we do. You know, kind of one thing that we know for sure is that the people that walk and people who earn sweat coins, even though they are centralized and inflationary, they value them tremendously because it's the value of their physical activity. Mm. So I'm sure that there will be ups and downs, but there is one huge advantage that we have over pretty much any other currency, it, because it's filled with the value of your physical activity, it will never go down to zero. Mm. People are just not prepared to go that far. And we've seen it already when, you know, kind of when we put things that cost quite a lot, people are like, there's no way that I'm going to put, I don't know, one million of my steps into this. This is, you know, kind of, this is ridiculous. So it's, it's amazing because what we're saying is that it's not about to the moon. No, screw that. What we are saying is let's find where the real value of physical activity lies. The reason why we're creating this token and the way we're designing it so that the world can actually find the point where the where the value of physical activity is and we can stop creating economy of movement around it. Mm. You know, yeah, yeah. Mentioned to insurers can use it, healthcare providers can use it. We already have a partnership with National Health Service of the United Kingdom where we're helping them to help people who have diabetic syndrome yeah. to find motivation to be more active. So we know this works and we know that these transactions are needed and having sweat and having the way it is um, kind of it is designed is going to you know basically enable this economy of movement of the future. Love it. Lo- also love the cameo. Welcome to join in. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. No, no, no. It's great. My I love it. My teenager needed, my teenager needed his device. <laughs> good, good, good. That's great. Okay, keep, keep the show authentic. Yeah. We're, not, we're, not a, we're not a mainstream news organization. Even that, there's a, did you ever see that one when the, uh, I feel like it was in the early days of COVID when it was like at CNN or some mainstream. BBC. Yeah, BBC. BBC and then and then the girl, the yeah. wife runs in with the baby. <laughs> that was one of the best moments in, in human history. Oh man, it was fantastic. I, you know, I remember that it made me really smile and laugh. Mm-hmm. Made me feel sorry for the guy because mm-hmm. he was just, oh my god. Yeah, and he was, uh, he was looking yeah. at the camera and go, oh my yeah, god. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's probably so embarrassed. We could all picture ourselves in the same shoes. <laughs> Uh, either way, Oleg, yeah. I'll say this. Um, I think what you're doing is just you're, you're headed. I, I don't know the answers. I can't imagine you know how this is all going to go, but ultimately there is a, a major crisis of uh, physical and mental health and targeting one of those, you know, particularly the physical aspect of it, driving in a, a new incentive system, using Web3 in new ways. Like, yeah, you stumble and fumble and figure it out. And some, some ha- like just going down this road and have been on podcasts, writing about what you guys are learning, help pave the way for understanding the psychology of how people are incentivized, what motivates people, how this Web3 framework fits into all that. And it's just like, I just commend what you're doing. I really was looking forward to having you on the show today because it, it does feel like one of these projects that has a has a has an awesome mission behind it, as opposed to just like, you know, something, make money, do this, blah blah blah. Uh, Oleg, where are you online? Thank are you. you are you writing, tweeting, any personal places we can throw out there? Yeah, um, I'm on Twitter, but I can't say that I'm uh, uh, terribly active because uh, I'm my typical bloke. I can't multitask if I go into Twitter, mm-hmm. uh, then the night is gone and, you know, can, uh, uh, you know, can, <laughs> I didn't see. So, um, yeah, Twitter would be, would be the best. Um, the best way to um, find me is uh, Telegram as well. Don't write me emails. I'm terrible on uh, email. My inbox is uh, <laughs> completely overflowing. So, um, 
what's yeah, what's anything, one what's anything tell me this what's one uh book that has influenced you the most or or a lot that comes to mind oh that is very very difficult to say oh yeah no i do know um richard bach um the uh johnson livingston the seagull okay awesome awesome well, thank you so much, sir. It was a pleasure chatting with you, getting to know you, getting to know what you're working on. I really enjoyed it and hope you guys keep crushing. Thank you very much, Mike. And absolute pleasure being here. And, you know, thank you for great questions. I really, really, really enjoyed answering them. Sweet. Have a very good one. See ya. Cheers. Bye-bye.